So one of the most reliable things to cover on drum YouTube is the kick drum. Everybody wants to know the secrets and everybody's got a take. And it's no wonder you're asking a part of your body usually reserved for walking or putting up on a coffee table suddenly to act with subtlety and coordination. And if you've been playing for a while and forget how difficult it is for newbies, just try playing doubles with your non-dominant foot. So I've weighed in over the years with what I've learned and I think a lot of it still applies. Recently I took a lesson here in New York with my friend and co-coach Jacob Evans from Drum Flow Coaching. Oh yo, what's up dude? And since then I've been helping to coach a bunch of students through the program that we're teaching jointly. And that's caused me to start experimenting with my setup. All of which has caused me to realize I may have missed a slight Mistakes were made. Anyway, what I learned and what that means for you on this lesson. Today on 8020, Kick Drum Wars. Stay tuned. Let's first talk about what I was doing before. My whole approach from before had been that stuff like distance from the kick drum and spring tension were overrated concepts. Whatever kick pedal I find on the kit, I just have to play it, I have to make it work. And I still think I had good reason to think that. After all, try playing in a cramped coffee shop or an off-off Broadway pit and see how much room you have to maneuver the kick drum. You think you're gonna play with perfect rebound without burying the beater in that scenario? Let alone heel down? What a fantasy. So I developed a more pragmatic approach. Again, here's more. And over the years, playing different people's kits, playing jam sessions, playing Broadway shows, I've learned that there's a little thing called adaptive muscle memory. So I had an approach that worked. I was sitting pretty. Why change? Well, there were two things. First, there's this 90 degree concept Jacob taught me when he was in New York. Which means the angle made at your hips and also the angle made at your knees should be equal to or greater than 90 degrees. That may not sound like much, but also remember the whole relaxation thing. Let's head over to the kit. The more I played with this concept, the more I realized you can be too tense even playing the kick drum. It's hard to describe, but it's kind of like bouncing a basketball. If you want to bounce it louder, you start from higher up. And if you want to bounce it faster, you start from lower down. It's the same with the kick drum. If you want to play it loudly and quickly, it's nice to kind of preload the leg. I realized if I can anticipate the strokes a little more, rather than just letting them take me by surprise, I can play loudly, more consistently, faster, and also stay relaxed. So that was the first part. But there's something else. I was watching a ton of video submissions from our Facebook group, and most of the students would have the same problem, something I'll call accidental ghost strokes. So we'd correct their technique or playing position or setup. And here's the thing, these folks weren't playing at a coffee shop or in a theater pit. Most of them have perfectly adequate practice space and nice equipment, but they were still playing with too much tension. So let's talk about what I learned. And I've always said that while it's not necessary to play without burying the beater in every scenario, you should be able to do it. But students in our program were ghosting the kick, which meant they were getting accidental extra strokes whenever they play the drum. And here's the lesson. You don't simply stop burying the beater by sheer will unless you want tension. You have to have the proper setup and technique. So let's go through the three things I'll ask students if they report accidental ghost strokes. Or echoes, maybe we should call them echoes. First, did you used to bury the beater? If the answer is yes, that probably means something with their setup or their playing position is off. Again, if you have the luxury of a big practice room and a DW9000, you should be able to set your drums up any way you want. The next question would be, are you resting your foot halfway down the foot plate or is it all the way? If I'm resting my foot all the way up the foot plate, that means the spring is having to do a lot of work to keep the beater out of the head. If I back my foot off to mid plate, the beater is going to rebound more freely. But you shouldn't have to rely on willpower or discipline to keep your foot from inching forward. If it's doing that despite your best efforts to stay relaxed, it probably just means you're sitting too close to the kick drum. So just inch the throne back or raise the seat until the ball of your foot rests naturally in the center of the foot plate. The third question, if people tell me yes indeed their foot is resting in the center of the foot plate, is this and get ready. Spring tension. 
I know, say it ain't so. You should be able to play any spring tension, right? Whatever kick pedal I find on the kit, I just have to play it, I have to make it work. Yes, but, yes, but, not if you want to be totally relaxed without burying the beater. There's what you can play in a pinch, and there's what's ideal. This occurred to me when I was traveling last week. I know, I know, I'm that guy. Anyway, I was playing some kits with really crappy spring tension. And I was either resting the beater on the head or getting shin splints until I reached down and nearly took my finger off trying to increase the spring tension. By the way, they should make it way easier to increase the spring tension. Anyway, let's go to the side camera again. Super easy heuristic. The spring tension should be just high enough that when you rest your foot in the center of the foot plate, the beater should naturally stay like an inch off the head. That should solve the whole ghost echo thing. So to recap the stuff I told the students. First, make sure your foot is no farther forward on the foot plate than halfway up. If that's hard to achieve, you shouldn't have to rely on willpower or discipline. Just inch your thrown back or raise it a couple inches until your foot is at mid plate. Next, if you're still getting echo strokes, increase the spring tension until the beater sits about an inch off the head naturally with your foot resting on it. If you're still getting echo strokes after that, increase the tension slowly until they disappear. And that's it. None of this necessarily negates what I've said in previous videos. It's more like if you have the ability to create an ideal situation without either tension or burying the beater, you should. Anyway, as you may have picked up during this video, Jacob Evans and I are actually coaching a group of people through this very stuff and a bunch of other stuff around playing with flow. Right now, we have a 12 week intensive program that includes weekly calls with both Jacob and me, an entire new curriculum, and we only open it up currently about once a quarter. But if you wanna get on the wait list for that so you can hear the next time we're opening it up and learn more about it, just click the link below this player and enter your email address in on the next page. Anyway guys, it's been real, always enjoy these. See you again real soon in another lesson of the week.